Welcome everybody uh, to webinar number six. Uh, this is going swimmingly at the moment. We're going to run webinars until uh, probably early December and they're going to, um, then we're going to take a break for Christmas, but they've been really good. So take a moment um, to find your Q&A panel or your chat panel. We're looking forward to lots of questions. And let me introduce uh, the series and our speakers. So um, if you saw the latest email that went out, ANOVA's fundraise is um, just about finished, I think. Um, and so we, we should um, check back in on them. But we had a fantastic discussion about how ANOVA hopes to um, expand uh, their their reach from the Northern Rivers area. And ANOVA's version of retailing and more democratic form of electricity retailing is sort of matched by Pingala. Pingala are looking at um, democratising capital, if you like. Uh, so they have a really interesting model that they're exploring around co-ops and a franchise arrangement of co-ops to really help people um, get solar, rooftop solar, and um, energy retailing uh, spread out throughout the community. Um, we also had Karina's AGM and we had a talk from Andrew Stock on the politics of climate and energy. He had plenty to say. It was just after the leadership coup in, um, in Canberra. Um, and we talked to Simon Corbell um, and Moreland Energy Foundation about their Spark Conference, which was two full-on days looking at uh, how our energy transition is going and a lot of those problems around vulnerable communities. And last week we went to Beyond Zero Emissions and Beyond Zero Emissions are doing a lot of work in communities with their zero carbon community action planning. And what they've found out is that communities don't have a lot of information about what their um, emissions are. So they're rolling out a tool to deliver uh, climate um, carbon uh, profiling in communities. And we also talked to their director of research who's doing a lot of interesting work on electrifying industry and how we go 100% uh, renewable. Today, I will introduce our speakers in a moment. Next week, Warburton Community Hydro. Uh, does anyone know anything about Run of the River Hydro? I do not know enough about it, and I'm really looking forward to um, hearing about their system. And there's a couple of um, uh, uh, videos online, time-lapse videos of that uh, project. And then webinar eight, we've also got one on solar gardens. Um, Community Power Agency have been doing a fantastic job trying to work out how do you do so, um, solar if you can't put it on your roof? So that's a, thank you for bearing with me while I went through that. I'd really like to see everyone at our, um, our upcoming webinars. But let me introduce today. We have Dave Rawlins from Quorum. And a few weeks ago, Dave wrote to Karina and Margaret and I sit on Karina, uh, the Karina committee, to say, thanks very much, guys. We're being really successful at the moment we're really starting to build some momentum and I nabbed both of them and said let's do a webinar on revolving funds because we think it's a really powerful mechanism so um, I am going to take you through a little bit of what the Karina revolving fund is and then I'm going to um, handball to Dave who's going to talk about what they've done in Mullumbimby um, I wanted to say Mwilamba there, Dave, uh, in, uh, in northern New South Wales. Um, but it all started uh, in South Australia with Margaret, our founder, who um, was on the walk for solar from Port Augusta to Adelaide, advocating for a big solar thermal plant and desperately looking for a solution that would empower ordinary people to start taking climate action. And so what um, Karina set up was a revolving fund. And in our five years, we've had $177,000 worth of donations, but because $133,000 of the money we've lent has been repaid, 
in total, we've lent three hundred and ten thousand dollars to twenty three projects. It's a fantastic story, and in the beginning, those projects were slow, but they're getting faster and faster. And you can see that we've done um, projects all the way around Australia. And Karina stands for Citizens Own Renewable Energy Australia as well. So this is a little bit of a look at the revolving fund model. We fundraise for every project that we do, but um, often you see on those uh, fundraising sites that uh, projects with a big ambitious target like $20,000 get started and then they sort of lose momentum. And the real value of the revolving fund is that we get a repayment from an old project and that tips it up again. So it really keeps the fundraising with a whole lot of momentum. And as you can see, whenever we're waiting for um, to fund a project, we've got quite a few older projects tipping into our revolving fund. And I've got uh, Bill Gresham's fantastic cartoon that sort of illustrates the same thing. A steady stream of donations in, people taking lumpy amounts of um, money out, but that continuous uh, dribble of uh, loan repayments coming back in as well. And just to really reinforce that, these are the, our first 23 projects. And you can see, obviously, the first one had no loan repayments in it at all. But you can see that a lot of our later projects are being significantly funded by loan repayments with a top up from newly donated funds. So and I thought the last thing I would talk about um, was just to clarify how our model works. So Karina don't own or operate um, the uh, projects and we do both rooftop solar and um, uh, energy efficiency if we can encourage community organisations to do that. We give no interest loans, so we don't charge any interest at all. And we lend our quick win projects is a loan to a community organisation. So we assess those projects on the basis that the community organisation does good in its community. And the main thing that we have with that community organisation is the loan agreement. But one of the real values Karina offers is that we help really get the project up and running. We give technical support and advice and um, help them choose the um, solar installer and, and the types of panels and make sure that our loan is going to a, a, a project that will last a long time um, and that that project will indeed save people money. So um, over time, the community organisation sees those um, savings on their, on their bills and the savings should outweigh how much they need to repay us and typically, our projects are repaying themselves in five, sometimes six years. So, um, and those community organisations are better from day one. Now, in the early days, Forum came along and today to tell the story about what happened when Quorum tried to get started. Okay, yeah. So, um, I'll just give people a bit of background. So. Quorum stands for Community Owned Renewable Energy Mullumbimby. And so um, we, we came out, we formed in about 2015. And um, at that time, in the previous years, there was um, concern about coal seam gas and there was um, blockades and things like that. So there was many people in the community that had already stood up and said, no, we don't want things like coal seam gas. And so a bunch of us were then like, well, and part of the gas was actually going to be used for local electricity production. So it's like, okay, if we're going to say no to this, well, what's the alternative? And so Corum basically um, came from there. And so we, we were very excited about um, finding out about core, so community owned renewables. And um, for us, like some of us came from different parts, like the, just purely climate and things like that. But um, the great thing about um, this movement is how we can decentralise the power and create a local economy as well as decarbonise. So um, with Quorum, so our goal is to have Mullumbimby running on 100% renewables by 20, 
20, which is a pretty big ask. Um, and I'll explain a bit about that later on. But um, what um, we felt was we had sort of seen about the Carina Fund and saw that was a great way for us to start. So although, um, and we're still working on some larger projects and things like that, um, what with the Carina Fund, so we felt it's a great way to engage the community and it's a great way that we can start off quite small and fundraise small amounts and just get solar panels up and just to demonstrate um, what we're doing. So the drill hall, which you can see here on the screen, um, that's a 100 year old building and that's um, currently arts space. And so we were talking to them and said, oh look, you know, would like to try this Karina style project. And um, this is um, one of the challenges, and, I'll, and we'll talk about them more, but is um, getting approvals basically to build upon the site. So it was fantastic that we had the drill hall that basically ran the project for us in the sense of we helped fundraise and things like that, but we needed to go through um, several different government departments to actually get uh, approvals. And so what it really showed in next slide, um, I'm not sure if that's going to come up by itself or... Um, yep. yep, sorry, busy, no, busy, fine. busy explaining why you're upside down, Dave. <laughs> ah, okay, and then just um, just go back one. I think Ooh, we skipped sorry, one. Sorry, that there one, we are. yep. And why I'm upside down actually is um, my webcams are not quite right. So <laughs> that's basically why. But what this slide is just showing is how the, the community can um, support these projects. And so Corum, although we've got this big aim of trying to um, basically decarbonise and run on renewables, we know that we can't do that by ourselves. And we also know that in our town there's already plenty of groups and there's some fantastic um, groups doing great work. So rather than us trying to actually build a member base of you know, like a thousand people from our town, what we felt was um, the best way to go was actually to support the existing groups. And so that's one thing that's actually been the success of the projects to date is, um, and they've been diverse. So the drill hall that was with um, like a theatre group and pottery um, studio. And then um, since then we've built six more projects and they range from things like the Showgrounds Trust, um, the museum, there's the Brunswick Valley Rescue Service as well, um, Federal Hall. And so each of those projects brings its own community. So when we try and raise funds, we actually can use their network. So what we're finding is when people donate to Quorum and the project, what they're actually normally doing is donating to their particular site that they would like to see solar panels um, built on. So um, that's a little bit of background of how we've got to where we are. So just to give you an update, so the drill hall was built in 2016. Um, and so since then we've installed, it, well, including that, we've installed 53 kilowatts on and seven project sites. And so what we've actually done is we've um, raised um, 65 grand for that. And so some of that's still in cash for the next projects. And like um, was demonstrated before, that's starting to flow through. So our aim was to build um, 10 projects by 2020. And in doing so, that would then enable by our payback to have two projects fund funded per year. Because what we find is that, um, you know, the, 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 there's the sort of donor fatigue and things like that. So it's fine. Like we found that the first project we raised um, six, like in sort of six weeks. And then each project that comes on, the donations um, and the crowd funding takes more and more work. And a lot of the people that did donate to, say, the first project, they still support and love what we do, but they don't necessarily feel like 
donating to each project that comes on next. Um, so what we're also doing, so with that slide that you saw before of the tap that's coming in, so not only do we do um, so donation-based fund, funding, um, sorry, that was you, your slide with the bathtub and the people scooping out. The, oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And so oh, but now, I'm, now I'm clicking all over the place. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Um, and so what we've also done is applied for government grants. And so that comes into our fund. And um, we've got grants from, say, Southern Cross Credit Union, which is our local credit union. And that's the one in this screen here where there's the big check. So that's what um, came from there. And so we're looking at all different ways that we can grow that fund. Um, and we're looking forward to actually getting to the stage um, and we've reached our growth goal of actually not needing to fundraise now so we can get two projects going per year. And of course, like we still will sort of fundraise if um, the chances come up and if there's a grant that we can go to, but it felt like we really wanted to put in some um, hard yards to like build that fund and I suppose Another thing, Corum, what we're wanting to do is um, actually service the groups within sort of Byron Shire. And um, what we, so our target isn't to actually grow beyond that. And so this, um, for us, the importance of this revolving fund was several things, but it was actually getting the community on side. Um, second thing was to demonstrate that solar panels basically pay their way. There's a lot of people that still, you know, may not believe that um, solar can, you know, be a financial investment. So if we're getting a chance to put solar on a community building and the people that use that space actually know that that loan will pay itself back within five years, then it's demonstrating that solar does work. And of course, it's meeting our goals to um, decarbonise as well. But what's, I think, gained um, the most enthusiasm is that our local community can actually sort of now smell the change of what we can create. So if we decentralise, we can actually get solar panels um, installed we no longer need to go out and be selling snags at Bunnings and things like that to raise funds just to pay their power bills. So it actually shows how we can circulate the um, economy. And that's been a real strength. And so if we're trying to grow the core movement and um, working on larger projects, which um, we hope to bring up soon, um, we need to demonstrate why that revolving sort of um, circulation of economy can work and things like that. So also, just a few more things that I will add. Um, we always try and design each project to um, have a five year pay, payback. So a lot, and so all our sites are behind the meter and there is some things like community halls that don't actually get used that much during the day. So some of the loads, like the load profiles don't quite match. So what we will always then do is either do a bit more fundraising or get the community group to put some in as well because we want um, within five years the community group to pay us back the interest-free loan but through the savings from their bills. So they're still going to save more than they would if we hadn't come along. And um, one thing that we've also done to um, ensure that is partner with ANOVA. Um, so as a local retailer here, and I've got a very high feed-in tariff. So one thing though, a lot of these community groups, because on their rates notice it's actually a business, um, they don't get that high feed-in tariff. So ANOVA will match that and things like that. So we're partnered there as well just to kind of stitch the projects across the line. Um, that's probably all that I wanted to talk about um, just now. One thing that I will touch on, I'm aware I've sort of already gone on a fair bit, but um, with the Repower campaign is, with our goal of trying to get Mullum to be 100% renewable by 2020, it's not just a, a case of us building sort of like the 
hydro projects and, and solar farms and things like that. But we need each household to basically also learn about solar panel, invest in their own solar, choosing what we're calling ethical electricity, which is basically making sure they support retailers that don't invest in coal and gas. And then also, importantly, making sure that people learn about energy efficiency too. So that's probably all, all I'll touch on for now. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of times for more chatting down the track. Brilliant. Thank you, Dave. And um, now I'll hand over to Margaret. Uh, welcome, Margaret. Hi. And um, I'll let you introduce what you're talking about there. Thanks, Heather. Hello, everybody. Um, okay, clever client. Karina has dreamt up for encouraging basically local councils to copy our model and do the same sort of thing in their own community. Uh, the name is important. We put clever in there because of, we think revolving funds are very clever, particularly as a mechanism for tackling the climate emergency. So it's clever climate economics. Um, it's so easy to end up focusing on dollars when you're talking about solar panels and of course, revolving funds revolve on the money that's in them. But um, but the reason Corinne is doing anything is because it's a climate emergency and we want to help organisations, in our case, who otherwise wouldn't be able to reduce their carbon emissions, to do so. Um, the, the thing which sparked this all off was just a few months ago, uh, one of the councillors at the Inner West Council in New South Wales contacted us and said, we like what you're doing. We think council might like to do something like this too. And suddenly this was a wonderful solution to probably the one downside of Carino, um, which even though our model is working very well and doing precisely what we set out to do, the scale is small. And suddenly there's, with interest from a local council, you know, the light bulbs went off. Councils have access to a hell of a lot more money than we do. And if they could copy what we're doing or tweak it to suit, you know, council circumstances, then s suddenly the whole scale is infinitely, infinitely larger. So next, please, Heather. So um, we quickly got, to, got busy and prepared some resources. Uh, this is our, the Karina website. And if uh, anyone who is thinking of talking to their local council and encouraging them to do this, or if there are any councillors listening, just go to projects, look for Clever Climate Economics, and there's a PowerPoint there which um, you can download, which explains every step of the way what you would need to do to set up a revolving fund to help all the residents in your area install solar. There's also, if you look down towards the bottom of the screen, you can see there an interactive Excel file. Um, if you, next screen, please, Heather. Um, you, councils can download this so that they can see how it would work in their own community. Up the top, you'll see a box with, which is currently displaying Adelaide. You can click on that to select your own capital city. Uh, the row, the cells immediately below that, you can enter whatever interest rate the council needs to pay on a loan to service this, this project, this revolving fund scheme. Um, also enter the local, the, the relevant figure for um, the solar intensity in your area, standard uh, electricity rates people are paying, and also the local feed-in tariffs that are available. And also select a um, payback term, in this case, 20, assuming five years. But, you know, if the council wants a different one, they can change all those figures. And in, in the bottom part of the screen, all those figures adjust to reflect what's been put in the apricot coloured screens. And also once, um, once they have get to the stage of deciding they want to do it and go out, uh, send out ten tenders to solar suppliers um, and know the actual cost of what, a particular size system will be in their area. They can enter that value in that apricot row, row 19, and everything adjusts again. And so this, um, this worksheet 
basically does all the calculations for them, tells them how much um, the, the quarterly repayments would need to be for a particular size system, how much it would be saving, depending on whether there's a, uh, most of it's used on site or only a little bit of it's used on site. And there's actually, that one that you're looking at is called funding model one, but there are four funding models depending on whether the council wants to charge interest or not, or build the interest cost into the loan repayments, um, depending on whether they need to pass on the GST or not. And what's the fourth one? Gone blank on it. <laughs> anyway, all, all the information is there for them to see how it would all work, customised to their own, their own region. Next, please, Heather. So, um, basically, Karina has provided the proof of the concept. Um, we've shown the way a revolving fund works. Um, and one of the key things there uh, is that the capital is never used up. It perhaps takes a while to get your head around that. But um, if you have a revolving fund, the money that you pay on a solar system comes back in via the loan repayments in our case or the just the solar repayments from a residence house if it's a council who's doing it um, and that money gets used again and again and again <laughs> and once a council um, perhaps well let's be optimistic here once every household in that council area has solar then the council is still going to get all the money back and can give it back to the wherever they lent it from or use it for some other purpose. The you know solar really does quite literally pay for itself. And and apart from the fact that councils have a lot more money than we do, um, they also can do a lot more projects at once. So they get the bulk buy type sort of benefits of slightly cheaper prices. Um, it's a bit. Okay, I won't go into that. That gets a bit complicated. It depends on exactly how the council sets it up, whether they need to have GST in the cost or not. Uh, next slide, Heather. So Darabin Council already has a solar savers scheme. Um, and they, keep, they always talk about the nonner effect. Uh, that demographic happens to have quite a vibrant Italian community. And apparently what they've discovered is as soon as one nono gets solar on her roof, all the other nonos in the street want it too. So it um, has a really, what, community dynamic engagement aspect, um, which helps it, I guess, be popularised and spread um, and be effective, really. Um, next, please, Heather. Um, I think I've already said most of this, haven't I? That the council designs their scheme, they ask for tenders. Once they've decided which supplier they want to use and which size um, installations they want to promote, um, then they ask for applications from residents who are interested. This is like an expression of interest and the installer then visits all the houses. The, the installer actually does a lot of the work. You know, they talk to each resident and make sure that their roof is suitable, make sure um, that what their wiring's up to scratch, checks and you know tells them if there's a shading problem or tells them really whether the amount of benefit from their solar will be uh, optimum or whether, you know, depending on the angle of the roof and you know that sort of stuff. So once the resident has a estimated um, savings from the installer. They can compare that with the quarterly repayments, which the council has told them that they would need to be making and just see how it would work for them. Um, in, okay, good work, Heather. I'm being too slow, am I? <laughs> um, okay, so the council, there's some more things to come here, Heather. Can you press enter again, please? Okay, so depending on exactly what the council wants to achieve, they can tailor the scheme accordingly. Um, in Darabin's case, they, because they did have a lot of pensioners who were struggling to pay their bills, uh, their electricity bills, they decided that they wanted um, the recipients of their, their solar scheme to have immediate savings, um, that, that, is a, that is a good thing. 
and I think probably many councils would actually have at least some people in their area who they would like to help out with immediate savings. But from a climate perspective, in terms of reducing emissions, if you keep the um, repayment time as short as possible. Um, so the council, for example, could set a five year payback time for most people, but you know, for people that they know are having trouble meeting their cost of living, they could allow a, long, a longer time if they want. Next, please. So the Karina, of course, uses is very lucky. We get lots of donations, which is free capital. We have no need to charge interest on the loans we give to community organisations. Uh, <clears throat> in council's case, uh, generally they would take out a low interest, uh, interest loan to fund the solar installations of people in their community. Um, but this isn't really a problem because the revolving fund works really regardless of exactly what the cost is. Um, the council can easily pass on the interest cost to the resident, just build it into their repayments, so that the only cost to council really is the work time um, from staff to set up and administer the scheme. The actual capital is in effect free, the same as Karina's capital is free. Next, please. In... Mm, there's a distinction between the payback time of the panels, which will vary quite a lot depending on the particular household and how many people home during the day and things like that, and the payback term set by council. Um, and in order for pretty well all residents to at least not be out of pocket in the short term while they're paying back their loan, um, most, most cities, a five year payback term will work. Uh, Darwin and Melbourne and Hobart would need to be a bit longer, um, but that's you know that that's fine. Just the idea is that it is customised to suit the local area. Next, please. So this is these are Adelaide figures again. So once a council has decided the cost the, the cost of what of the offer that they're making to their residents. A resident can look at this. Um, you know, all the figures will have been ad adjusted to sort of suit whatever the council's decided about payback terms and so on. And for example, um, basically it'd be up to the resident to decide whether they find this attractive or not. As you can see here, if you look under the five kilowatt column, uh, if most of it's used on site, it's going to actually pay for itself in half that time. And those people will get large immediate savings. But um, right down the bottom in the five kilowatt column, you see 5.07 years, which is um, probably for someone who and so they're only using about a quarter of the solar generation on site. So in that particular case, they would be slightly out of pocket during the payback time, but not by very much. That would equate to about $19 a year that they'll be out of pocket. So at the end of the five years, they've basically spent, what, $96 over five years and ended up with a free system. So, you know, it's, most people would not complain about that, but the council would simply sort of give the residents the information and leave it up to the residents to decide whether that was gonna work for them. But next, please. So, key points, the slide says it all, the things which I think are most important, that the solar PV pays for itself. So, in in a way, everybody's getting free solar and and council's not paying for it either. They're just paying for the, the work time to set up the, the scheme. Um, and if they pass on the interest costs, which they probably should, so that they don't upset other ratepayers, then that's fine um, and they can potentially achieve every householder in their whole area will have solar in their roof. Next please. So, uh, there are just some links that you can look at at your leisure if you want more details. Um, I should stress though that Karina is really keen to get local councils adopting a scheme like this so we're more than happy to help if you want to 
want help with contacting your local council, or if you're a counsellor who's listening to this um, and you have more questions, just get in contact with us via our website. We're quite excited at the thought that the revolving fund model could grow to be absolutely enormously effective in tackling the climate emergency much more than a small group like Karina could be. So that's it for me. Heather, thank you. Oh, I've gone too far. So that's fantastic. Thanks, Margaret. And as um, Sandra points out, that's fair dinkum climate <laughs> economics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the questions we had uh, in the sign-up was, uh, how can I establish a revolving fund? And I would encourage everyone who's listening... Oh, Mark Shakespeare raised the hand. Mark, find your Q&A panel and type us a question because we can only... Um, we can only see, we can't see you, we can only uh, read your, your questions. So um, how, how can I establish a revolving fund? I'd love to hear from you um, if you think we haven't answered that question. The thing we really touch on, guys, was um, it, Karina helped uh, Coram with the confidence to get going, in a sense, by, by saying, well, if you can't raise enough for your first project, we could lend you some. And so that really helped um, with the momentum. And Karina has a couple of um, projects where we've only provided part funding because the project itself has gone off and, and found other sources of, of funding. And, and Dave, um, have you adopted the Karina um, loan agreement Holus bolus, or or have you actually modified some of that we've, work to, yeah, to suit quorum? Yeah, we've modified it a little bit. Um, basically, what it's a case by case thing. Um, I suppose the big difference maybe between quorum and Karina is because um, usually we're working with people that and groups that we know well in our community. Um, there's kind of a level of understanding of their needs and their resources and their profile as well. So we, in some ways, simplified the um, agreement and which in some ways probably makes it not so, say, legally binding or something like that, but it's more just the um, MOU of how we can do the repayment. And um, one thing that Corum's um, because we've talked about this in meetings and things like that, is like how do we ensure we get the payback? But because what we're trying to do is actually not just get more solar panels up, but we're trying to give our local community groups repeat, like, um, re sorry, reprieve from their power bills. Um, if they get into a bit of a financial tight spot, then we can look at changing that. Or the other thing is we've also brought money in from funds like, say, a government grant and things like that. So um, the government, say, be federal or state, might have just paid for the solar to be put on that building in a different grant round. So the um, what we've done is secured that funding. So each time we can reuse those funds, we see as a bonus as well. So that's why we sort of streamlined it, I think. Does that make sense? Excellent. And, and you know, that... that um customising things to people's circumstances, it's probably worth mentioning that Darabin uh, had Brotherhood of St Lawrence and Moreland Energy Foundation as uh, helping them roll out a lot of their scheme. And so they really did spend a bit of time with people um, making sure that people were going to save money when they, when they did um, rooftop solar to their most vulnerable uh, members of their community. Margaret, have you uh, work? Yeah. Um, yes, th th that initially really was their main focus. Um, interestingly, more recently, I, uh, a year or so ago now, Darabin Council uh, declared a climate emergency and established a climate emergency action plan. And I've noticed that more recently they're PR material about the Solar Savers scheme is focusing more on climate and less on 
um, helping disadvantaged people pay their bills. Um, possibly they've already installed solar on all the disadvantaged households. I'm not sure, but. Mm. So um, let's ask the question, uh, what have you um, found most difficult in this journey? So, you know, it's really exciting that we're starting to see a bit of momentum, but it hasn't all been smooth sailing, has it? <laughs> the thing that no, I but... find most difficult is um, explaining the revolving fund to people and really it, it almost flies in the face of common sense that, people are ending up with free solar that um, which is you know with a with a revolving fund that does happen um, I just the other day one of the we have council elections in South Australia at the moment the results should be in in a few days and a woman who's running for one of the mayor of one of the councils here has been talking about how one of her one of her plans is for her council to establish a revolving fund so everyone in their community can have free solar and just the other day, the local, a journalist for the local RAG did some sums, worked out how many houses that would mean, got a costing on a 1.5 kilowatt system, which is too small, but anyway, that's what he did, and reported in the newspaper, local newspaper, that this would cost council $84 million <laughs> and just made it sound quite outrageous, really, for a mayor to be promising to provide free solar for everybody in the in the in their area. Um, so, yeah, it is, it is difficult because it's not really a, um, what's the word, a standard sort of thing, a revolving fund. I, even Karina, we were not really conscious of quite how powerful it was until we'd been operating for a couple of years and saw it in action. Um, so, just really explaining how the economics of it work um, is a big challenge. And that my experience with revolving funds was back in the um, late 90s when Newcastle City Council had one for their own energy efficiency project. So to me, it's always spoken to don't let capital be the capital can be made available if we're just a bit more imaginative about it. Um, Dave, tell us about some of the barriers Corum faced. Yeah. So one thing, um, the biggest challenge that we find is actually getting approval and permission from um, the the body that owns the like the site. So um, we so we've built um, seven projects, but nearly half of the projects there's another site like seven projects that we're trying to build, and either usually due to the tenure, but then sometimes due to shading and things like that as well, it didn't work. But um, we found it very challenging to work with the different levels of be it local government and then say, for instance, the drill hall, it took us nearly 12 months to get approval. So we had the funds raised, but because of the way that it was um, state, um, Department of Lands owned the building, but under a council lease, and then it was actually, um, so then leased through to the drill hall group. So one thing that we're really excited about now, because to change this is, um, because now we do have that capital flowing through, we're gonna actually start an expression of interest round. So previously, because it was all new, would go out and sort of almost source a group, or they'll come and talk to us, and it was very one-on-one -on -one and took a long time. But we feel now that we've got the, expertise and the just yeah um, confidence to, of knowing what we're doing we can actually invite groups to apply for the fund and in doing so they just need a letter of approval of the person that manages the um, like the site and that would save us lots of time so that's a big thing for us I, um, we have Sandra from Urala on online and I've always liked the idea that Urala popped up in a competition, you know, for the um, zero net energy town. And, the, it, you know, it really does, is a great way of measuring who's got the ability to club together and get something happening. So definitely, definitely worthwhile. The other problem Karina has faced is, um, we're, again, finding projects. 
because we rely on our members around Australia and um, the projects trickle in and at times in our five years we've been waiting for the next project in the queue and it can it can be very worrying and then we don't want to advertise too widely because we might get drowned in applications so um, backwards and forwards there. Um, let's let's talk about some of the additional benefits and, and the unexpected benefits that you've had um, in running your revolving fund. Maybe you start Dave? Yeah so I think it's um, it really is just how the community I mean with um, the climate crisis and what's going on it's very simple to get lost in despair and lose motivation so although um, on the scale that we're doing it you know we're the first to admit it's very small like the scale of the change we're doing but it actually empowers people to get involved and and they can see how that we can actually kind of reclaim um, by decentralizing that power network we are actually contributing to a local economy and so that's it's it's grown this feeling that now that we can do that and so that's been great and all our host sites to date then also join the repower campaign and then they switch so we've gone from a situation where we had a community almost all our community groups they were buying electricity that supported coal and gas and had no solar panels and now they've actually got solar they're creating income from that and they've divested from supporting coal and gas as well so for us that's a big change and has that given you lots of leverage because you're the um the good guys that have come along with the solar panel um to have those discussions about we'll go deeper and change your yeah. retailer it gives us an opportunity just to actually question or get people thinking about things and just sort of saying well if you're currently with this retailer, do you realise they're foreign owned or they're actually investing in coal seam gas when there was a very strong movement here, lock the gate. So it, it enables us to pitch them to start to dream of what we can create. And it's done because um, the projects are sort of tailored and it takes a lot of con you know conversations and you get to meet people. So it's done in a very informal way. But then um, we see it because then they start to put things on their Facebook pages and things like that, or they'll boost up, I'm um, not boost, but promote our posts and things. So yeah, it's, it's definitely, we've sort of seen to enable and support these groups and so, and they're grateful for that. So then they give us support when they can. Margaret, what are your thoughts? Um, well, Apart from wanting to reduce carbon emissions, one of the main motivations, one of the other main motivations for uh, setting up the Carina model was to empower people who wanted to do something about immediate and tangible, people who are frustrated with uh, lack of government progress, which still applies on tackling climate change. Um, and, but the unexpected thing really is that some of the people who are our recurring donors um, basically seem to be using us in a nice way um, instead of solar instead of carbon offsets so if they need to travel a lot with their work for example they will receive a donation for some random amount saying this is offsetting my flights um, we what we do can never be accredited as offsets so we steer clear of that word but it's obvious that some of our donors think of their donations to Carina as a way of compensating for other things, which other carbon emissions, which they can't reduce. And one very nice surprise was when the, um, the federal Greens MPs decided that they were not so pleased with the carbon offsets that they were buying for all their flights to and from Canberra. And so now every quarter they send us a nice big fat donation to help fund our projects as their compensation for their flights. And it, and it might be hard to um, justify it as carbon offsets, but at least our funding goes and goes and goes and never stops going. So um, I'm, I'm going to point out that um, Sandra has uh, said in Urala, the community benefit sharing initiative being negotiated with a large solar developer includes a revolving fund inspired by the fact that um, Urala had um, 
did some projects with Karina and uh, we introduced the concept of a revolving fund. Now, I think this is quite important because um, we see a lot of these large scale developments uh, agree to a community fund, but never anticipate that the community fund should do energy work. And they'll, they'll often do, you know, sports club sponsorship and stuff like that. And that is what maybe what the community um, values. But uh, Sandra, I'd, I'd be really keen to understand who's going to govern that, um, that revolving fund and, and how you've managed to, to talk them into that. Maybe you can type something in the chat panel there for us all to see. But, um, I, you know, I have wondered with people like SA Power Networks and our energy corporate, should, should we be asking them to spend their sponsorship money on stuff that's related to the energy transition and not just nice to have um, sponsorship? What do you think? I agree. <laughs> well, it comes back to your point, Dave, about um, how you need to engage people through the projects that we do together, isn't it? Yeah, sure. And also, I mean, that's another thing that um, I probably didn't make so clear, but one of Corum's aims is really how we can um, recreate a local economy. So. In theory, when we've sort of, you know, met a lot of our targets around re renewables and climate is that we'll actually have this large fund because we, um, as a community, own some larger infrastructure as well, that that can be doing in, in making a donation to the sports club, but yet we'll manage to transition in that case. So I think it's something we could always remember is it's in the way that we pitch that as well. So we can almost say that, you know, a donation to these sorts of projects is a stepping stone, stone that actually builds long-term capital. So it's not just a case of giving a one-off do donation to a, like a group that gets spent. Um, you know, it's probably to a worthy cause, but if we can actually invest that in a particular way that will, you know, continue to revolve, that's got, you know, just so much strength. And um, we copied, uh, I, I've just done a project uh, in the southern hills and coast south of Adelaide and we copied the uh, ANOVA calculation. Um, they had, when they were first setting up, looked at your region has spends $300 million on um, energy and an awful lot of that just goes straight out of the region and into um, corporate shareholder pockets many yeah. of whom may not be Australian corporate shareholders. Um, so it, it's, and of that 300 million, they calculated that they could keep $80 million a year in, in the community. I mean, that's, that's enormous uh, in terms of local economics. Yeah, it's just, I mean, here, you know, we're quite actually proud of what we've achieved, but, you know, we've only managed to raise like $65,000. But, you know, when you start to, actually because the energy market is so huge e even if we can just siphon off a very small percentage of that for this sort of work yeah it's it's huge but it's also about using the resource isn't it i mean there's something wonderful about the fact that the sun shines on everybody yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very democratic so Sandra's come back to us. Um, they're talking with their regional Australia bank, their local credit union, on models that might work for managing or, or um, dealing with the, um, the funds from their big large-scale solar that they're, um, they're looking at and um, spreading the benefit around many community groups and sporting clubs uh, to make sure it goes all the way through their community. Um, banks is an interesting uh, issue because when we speak to Upper Yarra um, Hydro next week, their partner is a community bank. And of course, community banks are a Bendigo bank model, but they're where Bendigo as the corporate has gone, oh, I can't service this area anymore. And the banks stepped up and gone, or the locals have stepped up and said, well, we'll run the, we'll run the bank. Um, local economics um, 
opportunity there, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I'll just quickly add as well is that um, just seeing Sandra's note there about, you know, the benefit from the solar to generate income is we always try and oversize as well. So it's not just meeting the, like, the direct needs of the building. We try and um, find that sweet spot and usually put sort of like six and a half kilowatts now that the way the price works um, onto each building, even if they've got a small load because we know that once they've paid us back, then that's money just coming into the, that they can use to, you know, just pay their bills. And it's also reducing greenhouse gas emissions of somewhere. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, on the, on the council scheme, um, at this at this stage, Darabin City Council is encouraging everyone to install five kilowatts. Um, in the early days, they were using tended to go for smaller smaller systems, maybe two or three kilowatts. Um, but they're now, partly because it's the most cost-effective size in terms mm. of dollar per kilowatt hour generation, um, but also, you know, from a climate perspective, um, if it works financially for the resident and they are only using a tiny bit on behind the meter and the rest is being exported, that, that, that's wonderful as a, uh, a climate action that that household can take. Uh, simply as, you know, as Heather Definitely. said, because, because it's, um, you know, even if they're not using it themselves, someone on the grid who otherwise would be using black or brown coal fired generation is having lower carbon emissions than otherwise. That unreliable black and brown coal is coming from New South Wales, hey? <laughs> the non um, so we're, we're, yeah, we're coming to um, the, the end of our session here. Uh, this is your last chance audience for, for questions. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, each of you to, to sort of give a wrap up reflection on what you would recommend um, to people about getting started in their community, Dave? Um, I think use your existing networks. So um, there's always, yeah, like community links and things like that. So I think, um, and there's obviously people to support you as well. Like we're just so grateful of all the help that Karina gave us and so um, yeah, if there's groups that are located near us that would like to do something similar as well, would love to spend the time to help support you um, so you can make a start. And uh, I'm just going to weigh in here um, that we have seen different fundraising models and um, so Bendigo Sustainability Group have been awfully successful um, getting their funds from local businesses um, and giving them a plug as being the good guys who are supporting the projects and supporting the group. And um, in a West uh, that in Sydney that I was speaking to the other day said they raised $16,000 at a quiz night, but there were a lot of local doctors and, and people like that um, at, the, at, at the table. So... Um, and Inova has spoken about the, the local philanthropists coming out in force once their projects started to get a bit of momentum. So I, I think that's really interesting, um, discovering how to engage with people and, and who, who is prepared to come on the journey with you. Margaret, what would be your um, final thoughts for people? Well, I was just listening to Dave's final thoughts and found myself nodding and thinking, yes, this is really, really good, the local focus and the local community aspect. Um, but one of the actual founding thoughts behind Karina was there an appreciation that there are lots of individuals scattered all over the place, not necessarily in supportive communities or environments, who really get left out in the cold if, they, if there's not a local group that they can work with. Um, and which was one of the reasons why Karina deliberately um, made everything really internet based and reached out to people all over Australia. Um, if, when we were working up the Karina model, I was very conscious of Hepburn Wynn, which at that time was, uh, I think, the, well, one of two um, community funded renewable energy initiatives. And that was really exciting, very, very admirable. But for people who didn't live in Victoria or didn't live in that 
town was kind of like, well, we wish we had one. So Karina was wanted to reach everyone who fell into that category of, I wish we had one of those and make, every, make it possible for anyone anywhere to actually get involved in community energy. Definitely. Um, getting, we can be the demonstration project, but um, getting access to everybody, it's a lovely, excellent idea. So um, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Um, Embark Coalition for Community Energy is uh, now, now has DGR status because we've merged with Embark. So um, anyone who enjoys our webinar series is welcome to uh, donate to us. So that would be very much appreciated. Thank you so much, Dave and Margaret, for joining us tonight. And um, thank you to our audience. And we look forward to seeing you in our next webinars. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. See you later. Thank you.